Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of Engaging Ideas, the Parsons TKO podcast. And today, we'll be talking with Kevin Smith as our special guest, and we are going to dive into a very interesting topic on this podcast. We're going to talk about sports marketing, affinity, and community building, and how that relates into nonprofit uh, community building and affinity work that you all do out there all the time. So thank you for joining us, and please don't forget to subscribe or leave us a review at the end of this episode. So welcome, Kevin. So Kevin is a 30-year sports media and marketing executive that includes roles uh, and at companies. He's a founding partner of Leverage Sports and Sponsorship, currently serving also as an adjunct sports business professor, the sales program advisor, instructor, instructor and leadership coach with TCU, Texas Christian University here in Fort Worth, Texas. He's a career strategist, certified coach as well for pro readiness coaching. And he also was part of launching Fox Sports NFL Sunday Ticket, which I, of course, am a fan of. I don't know how many people in our audience are, but I have been a subscriber of Sunday Ticket for a long time. And with all my moves uh, around the country, I've greatly appreciated being able to watch my Philadelphia Eagles uh, wherever I am. So thank you for that, sir. Welcome. Heck yeah. We had a lot of fans just like you, different markets. It's amazing. You get those loyalties, Eagles, Commanders, I guess, yeah, there's loyalty there as well. But, you know, Cowboys, wherever you go, there's certainly a, a fan base that'll follow them. Mm. It's easier today, but certainly wasn't many years ago. So it was a, it was a fun ride we went on. Well, you have this tremendous run up and it, this is good. You are our first person who's not directly within a nonprofit. I mean, we could consider the university, uh, but coming from this sort of sports marketing world and you and I had a very serendipitous meeting in the rare Texas rain. And we were both heading on a, to see a morning talk to listen to Sint Marshall, the CEO of the Dallas Mavericks, which was a fantastic uh, breakfast conversation. And you generally generously started sharing with me a bit about your class. And it really struck me about the courses you run there and some of the programming you do about how would you build affinity and build community for a team within a local area. And that really struck me as this is a lot of work that has to happen in nonprofits. Like it's never been just about reach. It's always about engagement. How do they, once I've got your attention, how do I get you to feel a part of the mission with me? And so I've been really looking forward to this conversation to see how we could bring these two pieces together. But, you know, cause I know a little bit about it, but the audience doesn't. Can you just tell us a little bit about the class you're running um, at TCU and the role sports marketing could play in developing communities and how you've sort of put that program together with your students. Yeah. First of all, let's go back. So though that rainy day, I kind of question your judgment. Why are you following me? You know, where are we going here? <laughs> you didn't know where I was leading you, number one. But number two, <laughs> obviously we go here, Sint Marshall, who's the CEO for the Mavericks. And, you know, if you're looking for role models in the industry, just leaders. You know, she spent many decades at AT and T. And I, I don't care if you're in sport, you're in nonprofit, you're in again high tech. Scent is one of those people that just you gravitate towards. And it was, to your point, it was great to spend that time with her uh, just to come together. And sometimes you, we get a lot of speakers. We're very fortunate at TCU. Sometimes they really resonate with a lot of audiences. And she was one mm -hmm. that uh, was just a lot of fun to be a part of. So it was nice to, nice to have that. So again, thanks for having me on this one as well. And heck yeah, we have a uh, sports marketing program. It's called Sports Entertainment Marketing is the specific class I'm teaching right now. It's one that, you know, has been going along. I've been in sport for, again, all the years. And thank you for the introduction on that. And it's becoming, it's big business, just like anything else. I see so many families and students and everybody coming, hey, sport, sport, sport. And so it's this emotional platform, which I also think causes and philanthropic endeavors. It's the same way. What are these emotional platforms that allow us to change behaviors hmm. that we do it? And, and how do we leverage those for the actual intent of it? But also it's it can be a strategy. It can be a tactic. And sports is one that ultimately sport is a big business, but also it's a strategy. We started a sports marketing program in the business school at the University of Oregon, probably 27, 28 years ago. It's called the Warsaw Sports Marketing Program. A friend of mine, Jimmy Warsaw, who is phenomenal within the sports industry, uh, endowed the program, put it in the business school where it belongs, because we're talking about something that is, it's got to drive business, just like Parsons TKO. It's got to, what's the business? How are we helping what we're trying to accomplish? It's still got to generate revenues, create value. And for sport, people are saying it, it take it away from this fluffiness to truly something that is tangible. And we did it at that time. I set this program up at TCU probably a dozen years ago. Hmm. Same thing where it was, you know, there's just such a demand. I had the dean call me in and said, Kevin, we've got, you know, X number of students walking through our door. 
to come here for admissions to say, why am I going to pay $200,000 to go to the school? Right. He goes, a third of those students are asking about sports because right. I need to solve that problem. So he wanted to start a sport program similar. And I said, no, because it's just a saturation. I said, I want to teach students to be great marketers and to be a great marketer, you have to understand just what I said, those emotional platforms, sports, entertainment, philanthropic or cause related uh, activities. And if you can do that, again, you get people's attention. You can cut through the clutter in the marketplace because we're, we've got so much content, so much access to everything every day that how do we, where's our attention? What grabs our attention? What holds our attention? What engages us? What builds that affinity, obviously, that we we will talk about in depth as we go on with this. So I said, I'll create a sports marketing or a sports marketing program, but it's kind of marketing first and sport is a part of it. I take undergraduates uh, and I, I love that. You know, we get to grad school, it gets a lot of numbers crunching as we, you know, deep dive. But I love these 18, 19, well, maybe not that age. Give me the 20, 21, 22 year olds that have had a chance to kind of work through their engagement and in, in, in going into college and all the things they think they have to go do, let them go do it. And right. I take the juniors and seniors and we just, we deep dive. How can we leverage this? How can we have some fun with this? And on that day with the, the Mavericks that we talked about in St. Marshall, they're looking to play a game. So it's the Dallas Mavericks and it's in a Dallas Fourth Metroplex with about eight to 9 million people. So it's a larger Metroplex, but it's still different parts of the Metroplex. Right. And on the Fort Worth side, uh, they were looking to play a game, which is where Texas Christian University is at, TCU. Well, people, again, that have anything to do with Dallas, they're kind of, those in Fort Worth will kind of push it away. So she was going, how can we build something? And she, I say she and her team, her marketing team, they're going to play a game in Fort Worth in a preseason game. So it's a lot of fun, but she's going, that's just an event. That's just one singular activity that you may or may not be successful. How do we build engagement with the community? Mm -hmm. How do we build that word, that affinity, that likeness? They like us. They just, they want to be a part of it. They're going to wear that Mavs jersey where they feel like it's a part of me. It represents what I stand for. And that was the whole quest for Scent. She was speaking, but we took the project on as a class because I've got uh, this particular class. We had 30 students, Tony, and also we've got to there from 14 different states around the country. One of the things about TC, which I really like, it used to be 75, 80% Texan, and now it's about 40%. So we have young men and women from around the country. And so it's just this diversity of thought, of viewpoint. And so just they had their own introduction to Fort Worth and what that stood for, or Dallas or Texas in general. I've got five young men and women from Atlanta this semester. I haven't had five in 10 years. I, I don't know why they all came at once, but I said, <laughs> thank you. You're welcome. But again, they bring their own perspective. So we just got to have good dialogue. Oh, sorry. Yeah, I was just going to say that. that part, yeah, that part is super interesting to me because it's how can the Mavericks and then the class and the way you took it make more than just the event, make it about the team, make it about the community. That in the nonprofit space, that happens all the time. They'll throw a gala mm -hmm. or there'll be an event or there'll be the online something they do. Or even if you think of some of the bigger ones, you know, like a, a run or walk for life, those things that happen. But yeah, I mean, how, so how did it happen? So if they're doing just one event, how did they build more of the affinity around it. And I guess before we keep running with the word affinity throughout the, the podcast here, I don't know if you've got a definition for us mm -hmm. just so here in the audience, we can hear it too, but that, that feels really resonant to what nonprofits need, which mm -hmm. is how do I get you to then take this mission forward to not just show up for this one day? Yeah. Affinity can be used on the front end of the conversation or the back end. Sometimes on the front end, we have an affinity for a team, a city, uh, we have a team for Philadelphia has just rabid fans, for example, and there's an affinity towards their teams, the Sixers, the Flyers, you know, the Eagles, they're going to enjoy that. They're going to have it. There's an affinity from the very start. So we leverage that, that likeness, that wanting to wear the jersey, be a part of something bigger than themselves. Mm -hmm. And so we can leverage that way. And then we got to find ways to have experiences, uh, have interaction, multiple touch points that allow us to kind of deepen that relationship and then ultimately hopefully get an engagement going where they want to be a part of what we're trying to do. So if any can happen on the front, they're giving us the benefit of the doubt and we right. then find, we give them reasons why they want to engage with us further. And then we build that long-term community where the backside, again, we're out there just creating the engagement and ultimately they don't know about the Mavericks. Why would I support that team? We're giving them reasons. And so what we might do, Tony, is that one event that we have, the game they're going to play in Fort Worth, which is about 45 to 50 miles away from Dallas and their home arena, 
say that's a tentpole event. And he guess the nonprofit space, exactly. We throw things, we kind of are galas, we put together, we try to make happen and everyone's got to come together and we're waiting for everything just to be perfect. It can't be, but then how do we, again, book in that with other things that we can do on the front end and the back end. Right. So what the Mavericks did, so we're going to play a game. Our, our temple is say it's, it's in September will be the game. Can we do camps over the summer? You know, come over and do Dallas Mavericks run camps for youth. Can we do a business symposium with uh, the local Rotary Club? Hmm. Can we do a, you know, they were looking at, they have an esports team. Can we do some kind of activity or event over here or different parts of the Metroplex? So you find ways that you can seed that process. To, it's a buildup. So you're having a chance to engage people throughout. So the time we get to the actual event, we built a pretty good buzz. We built, we know we've got some a return on that. And our chances of success will be higher. But also we've touched people along the way that we probably wouldn't get if it's just a standalone event. And the same thing on the back end. How do we then take that and build it on the back end? What are those set triggers we have along their journey that, of a relationship with us? And then from that, again, the affinity at the start or the affinity at the back end, we're still looking to build that relationship through engagement, through touch points, through social experiences, all these things that can come together with other like-minded people. And that's kind of where, how we use that event and what they were looking for. And so, you know, they're going to measure it. So basically maybe it's social media traffic. They can determine where that's coming from. Maybe it's merchandise sales. Maybe it's, you know, not necessarily the tickets because if I'm going to, am I going to buy tickets to drive 50 miles? I'm probably not. Right. So that's not necessarily a you know a good touch point, but what can be? How can we engage this and feel like they're part? So people just again feel they're part of something. They're on the back of their car, their license plate has you know Dallas Mavericks. There just becomes this affinity towards this team that they're willing to put their own personal reputation and their own personal brand out there to say, this is an integral part of who I am. I'm a Mavs fan, or I'm a nonprofit fan. I believe in the cancer society or whatever it may be. I kind of wear it, kind of my badge of honor. And that's a little bit of an affinity. And from that, there's got to be some benefits and benefits and value that come from that. But ultimately, that's what we're trying to get them to, to feel uh, as they engage in this. Yeah, I mean, some of the takeaways I had was writing down when you were talking, especially in that approach of what they did to come in and find all the surrounding pieces within the community. Mm -hmm. For a lot of nonprofits, a lot of times, I know there's this sense of they're almost going it alone. And like who around them could they partner with that might be tangential, like the Rotary Club or these different groups. And then as the facilitator of bringing a lot of that together, your brand and your name and your recognition stays there and it's showing you're a part of it and it's giving other people access and avenues. So just for anyone listening, I mean, that's, it's a really interesting point is like, as you're setting up some of these entries into new markets or setting up these events, like where else can you leverage partnering that sort of expands maybe even tangentially to where you could have been. Um, but I know you also had done some work. So you, uh, you were the CMO and you launched one of the biggest street basketball tournaments in the U S uh, which is really cool. Cause when you talked to me about it, I had heard about it uh, growing up too. And I actually went and watched them. I remember going to watch some games uh, when I was younger. If you could tell us a little bit about that and also just yep. the lessons you learned because you were you had one place and then you went to the next community. So like, mm -hmm. how did you leverage and what did you learn along the way as you kept building and expanding it out? Cause we, there are a lot of nonprofits out there that have started smaller and then, you know, what do they do next? Do they franchise or do they team up with someone else in another city that's already doing it? And I know there's a lot of thought about that is how do, how do we do more, better, faster, good out there, but then also still keep a, a steady brand. But yeah, tell us all about it. I, I'm excited about this one. I was actually an event manager for this. This was early in my career, so wasn't quite hadn't reached the okay. the C level on that, and versus some other things that I did. We actually were looking. Um, it was because of a media partner. Uh, this was in the Dallas Worth area, so D Magazine, which is our local lifestyle magazine. Okay. We created a three on three basketball tournament called Hoop D Do, and it was basically a fundraiser for Texas Special Olympics. Huh. And that was the intent. So it was really promotion. The magazine was looking to be that good community partner. How are they out in the community looking for things? Their publisher was pretty innovative in what he was looking to do. We had kind of this idea of playing this street ball, putting it together. And we just did that first tournament, not really knowing who's going to show up. And let's just say it, it caught fire pretty quickly. Wow. And all of a sudden, within our year two and three, we've got 
uh, about 10,000 players on the streets that we are blocked off. We put up over a hundred basketball goals outside and just had the street festival. So it was an experience. Yeah, we were playing basketball, but it was just coming down and just a part of the, the community, what was going on, ultimately still being a fundraiser for Texas Special Olympics. You know, the challenge was because we had to have, if I was going to run a tournament with 10,000 players and let's just say 50 to 60,000 spectators over the, over the weekend, you had to have a lot of volunteers to make that happen. And just like anything else in the nonprofit sector, <laughs> it's about engaging people, finding ways to get them involved. Well, this was a tough ask because this tournament, basically we went, it's in, it was in June. So it was the heat of the summer. So I'm going to put you on asphalt. I'm going to have you judge and referee a game where people maybe get a little heated sometimes, you know, and you're a volunteer and kind of put it together. But it just kept growing and growing. We were pretty amazed and eventually said, how do we create a what kind of a grassroots marketing tour around the country in a number of places? So we uh, we did 19 cities that very like our third year. Then we did 35 cities the, the following year. But going into new markets, you know, was a difficult one. I so it was in Dallas. We did it. I went down to Austin, Texas. Started one there. But instead of making it easy for the operators to pull that off, so I'd be the sports company, the nonprofit. What was best for the guests? What was best for the players? We blocked off Fifth and Sixth Street, which are very high profile streets within Austin. And just made it a festival. I then went into Washington, D.C. I blocked off Constitution Ave wow. and ran the tournament there just because you're right next to the Capitol. You got the lawn or you know, the lawn right there. You just got thousands of people that will engage. And our partners were Pizza and Pepsi. They didn't care where they came from, but they were wondering over, what is this street ball stuff? And it was just great fun to pull that off. It was hard as heck because you, just like any other event, and especially running with minimal resources, you know, you, you finish at midnight, you get a couple hours of sleep, you get up and you're back on site four or five in the morning, off you go and, and do it that way. And DC was, was difficult. I moved, I drove into town. And one of the things, Tony, you and I've talked about prior is really from a resource perspective, the perception right. that sports have a lot of resources. Overall, they don't. Players make a lot of money when it's guaranteed. You know, teams can sometimes, but it's really about TV driven. The difference between nonprofit and the sports world is basically the media. Hmm. Everything else the same because sports don't want to pay for anything. You know, they just, they are cheap with it and just go forward. They don't have the money because everything's kind of been guaranteed. We got to guarantee the player, the product, the service, such an amount that everybody else is working on peanuts. So I go into DC with one contact who was the marketing manager for the Washington Post. And that's it. And I had to go put on a tournament so that 10,000 players and 100,000 spectators could show up, make it happen. And you just, you're creative, just like anything else. So sport is one that I could at least call people. I remember at that time, Tom McMillan was a congressman. It just, you know, you could call people that were the sports related, just like any other industry you know, who are those friendlies that you got to lean on? And we did it. And, but I had to have the media partner. That was, if I didn't have the media partner, I couldn't have done anything what we did within a new market because that was kind of the key resource. No matter what we did, how would we effectively communicate it with the audiences we needed to communicate it with? Yeah, that's, that is, I, I really like your uh, comparison there with the media being the front and the sort of focus on that and, and the ability to get onto those large channels right the the one that everyone's going to see i'm curious too though i mean it sounds like with the grassroots movement and going into dc it's not like word of mouth might have been a big part of this you know and i know a lot of nonprofits count on that too like what's your experience with that sort of buzz building word of mouth marketing and yeah how did that play into creating this and getting it out into the new cities i i think it it played a lot at that time tony and i think it probably plays more now I mean, think about the ease for which we, if you and I go to an event in a local city, a you know music festival, I may text you, say, buddy, hey, don't do it. It's, it's a pain. You know, parking sucks. This, I mean, just I'm able to walk through it so quickly. It's just if you don't do it well, people are going to know pretty quickly or vice versa. Tony, you got to get here. Come on. There's good things happening. And I think just because of the effective communication, uh, we're empowering people to do that. And if you don't have that, you miss out a lot. And I'll, I'll use an example, a non-sport example. I actually got out of the business for a short bit just to, I guess, prove that I could. But I was moving back from Australia 
to the United States and I didn't want to go back to New York or LA. And a friend of mine just happened to be CEO for PF Chang's, a restaurant chain. And they were launching a small chain called, you know, Payway Asian Diner. He goes, they helped me launch this thing. I was going, sports and media, rice and noodles. He's right. going, it's building a brand. It's what you do. And I did it. And it was just fascinating. I was the only person I got to ask a lot of dumb questions. They tolerated me, but I brought a different perspective again. How do you, a real hospitality entertainment environment. But one of the things I did is go in and all the managers we were kind of measuring ourselves. How are we doing with our engagement of our audiences? So whether you're a sport entity, a restaurant or a nonprofit, we're always, we need to have our you know thumb on the pulse of how are we really doing besides what we think we're doing? Right. What's our objective measures that we're seeing how we're doing? And we have the typical surveys, one to five, you know, one being horrible, five being you are a rock star, three being good and, and four being above average. Well, one of the things I did, I immediately cut out threes and fours. I only tracked fives hmm. and I just, all the managers just you, you don't know the industry. You cannot do this. And I go, if we're going to get word of mouth, we have to deliver an experience that they're going to go willing to do that. Our highest performing stores equal to or better than, and this was, we got probably 120, 125 stores at this time. Payway Asian diners, a quick, casual uh, Asian place to go. Uh, the stores that had that, those fives, were the highest performing ones because it was me willing to put my reputation on the line. Tony, I got a place I just tried. You need to try it. I'm going to, I'm going to take you because mm -hmm. it was a five experience for me. If it was a four. It's nice. I'm not going to say anything to you unless you bring it up. Right. You may ask me, oh, yeah, I tried that. It was pretty good. But if it's a five, I become your avid fan, that rabid fan that it is. I'm going to, that word of mouth has substance at that time. And our stores, we didn't advertise. We just, mm -hmm. we spent the experience when you walk through the door at that time, this is when quick casual was kind of growing a little bit, but I wanted to make you my friend. I wanted to share something that was important to me that I found that I really liked. And so the, it was word of mouth. And so if we're going to really do that and do it well, we got to make sure we're looking at the right metrics because we just think, oh, they like our cause. Of course, they're going to go ahead and talk about it. Have we given them the talking points to be effective with that communication? Have we seeded that? Are they emotionally charged? So when they go have the conversation, the people on the other side just sense the, you know, the pride and the joy and being a part of this cause that, yeah, give me a little of that. I want a little of that sauce. And so how do we, you know, just empower those around us? So word of mouth is huge, but it's got to be done well. And too often times we just assume because we're drinking the Kool-Aid, we think others will quickly as well. And we got to really walk them through that process, get them inside the ropes a little bit and allow them to have that same enthusiasm that we might have for the, the cause and the mission. Yeah, you really got my my head spinning on a few things. And then I want to dive a little more into some of the measurements uh, and tracking that we had a question about too. But what I wrote down as you were talking at one point is communication is or as the experience, like mm -hmm. what we are putting out. I think so often that we're getting messages out and then we're waiting to see the reaction rather than thinking of it as the full experience that they're about to have with us is from the way I am sending that email and the links that I sent them and what I curated for them ahead of time to give them the experience mm -hmm. that's going to make them want to keep coming back or the way that they came to my event and what they had there creates the, so the actual communication itself, not just the event, not just the moment of playing basketball, not just the moment of the gala where we had a great speaker for you. It's it's everything that went into that is that experience that builds. And yeah, I think that might not get its full due or credit. And then, you know, another thing with my company, what we talk about is we came up with, we call it engagement architecture. And because the idea was that nonprofits, it's not just about attention. Like you're never going to write a salacious headline just to get a couple clicks because you don't get any money out of that. And it would just ruin right. your brand. You know, it ruin your brand. Uh, and then for us, it was, okay, well, if I had attention, are you prepared to then start cultivating this new relationship? And how, I think you had said, you know, you were looking at the restaurants that had the five experience because you knew at the five level, everyone else would start talking to everybody else about it. That goes into, you know, we've done a lot of work over the last year. And I, some of it, I think in the nonprofit industry has just been, there's always a lot of changes in CRM systems or email systems or what folks are using and how they're categorizing it. That, segmentation has been hard. Everybody wants to get to personalization, but they're still not even able to segment to say who's been most engaged. Mm -hmm. And if you're most engaged, if you're at my four to five level with my nonprofit, mm -hmm. like, can you send me something different than the other people that are at the one or two? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah. So I, I'm taking a lot of lessons here in the same way. And I hope everyone's hearing that is that, you know, that focus on, you have to have something different for the five. That's just, you know, you want the ones and twos to come because they're buying your meals and it's helping the business grow, but they're also not amplifying it in the way. So you got to do something a little different for that top. Um, those, that was, yeah, as you're talking there, that's what I was thinking about. And then you started talking about some of the the measurements and tracking. And, you know, we had a question there for you too, just about tracking affinity building and engagement. You know, what are some of the signals that you are looking for when you're trying to make an impact? And you had, you wrote me back and you had said, you usually like to do uh ROO versus ROI for ROO being return on objective. And I really like that because that to me, again, really signals in, I actually love it because it's, it's so fits in with the nonprofit space because it's not necessarily return on investment they're trying to get they are trying to get return on objective mm -hmm. uh so yeah i'd love to hear about this as, as well as i think everyone in the audience and you might have given everyone a new frame for their next board <laughs> board presentation so <laughs> well it, you think about it tony roi return on investment it's hard to to predict or follow through all the time and it becomes so black and white and what we do with sport with cause again we're an industry that's dealing with emotions there's a lot of movement and things and how do we just get people engaged? And so what does engagement look like? Have they come to two events a month instead of one? Have they made a purchase? Have they had a, a dialogue with somebody? Did they follow up? What was our push through rate if we did send out something? Did they tell a friend? You know, do they recommend us in that way? And again, that you've got to find ways to measure that, but those are ways that are they truly engaged and feel a part of this community, a sense of belonging. We're all looking for that sense of belonging. And are we empowering them to feel good about that? Because if we do, they will be our biggest advocate. And all we have to do is seed that process uh, as you go forward. I've looked at it as uh, merchandise sales. I've looked at online traffic um, of ways to engage. I've looked at partner involvement. If we've been able to engage audiences, all of a sudden partners pay attention to that. When I say partners, it's other like-minded organizations or ones that are footing the bill for and with us. I love that you just you find ways to engage people to give them what they want. And so how would we measure that? You know, how would they follow up? And it's really relationship building as you go forward. And so what's the relationship? And you and I also you know, talked about a a book that has come out called, you know, Fans Have More mm -hmm. Friends. And it's a book written by the senior VP of strategy and innovation at Fox Sports. So basically they're, they're betting on billions of dollars they're spending on sports properties. You can't mess up on that. You know, you know, $10 it upsets us, but you know, 10 billion, we got to make sure we're right. So the, the stats better be the metrics behind it. What are they looking at? And they wanted to find a way to... Engage audiences. Now, one thing that sports has that the nonprofit sector does not, which will always be a differentiator, is live sports. Mm -hmm. It's not on demand. I'm not going to watch Temple basketball or or the Eagles football. You know, if I already know the score, I may watch some highlights, but I'm not going to watch the game. And so it's this tune-in value. There's always that live component in our society with we have access to so much content on demand, sport is still one of those few things that it's live. And that's why they're commanding huge rights fees for what they're producing as you go forward. That's the biggest between those, the, the two, if you yeah. will. And so how do you, you know, how do you leverage that and make it viable? We've got to find a way, we got to be better storytellers in the nonprofit sector because we have a lot of the same stories and we don't have the live television component that's there that we know there's going to be an instant tune in, right? that we don't have that opportunity so we got to find ways to to engage people uh, and go forward. But let's let's be smarter with what you know sport is doing. Or sometimes we why wouldn't we partner with sports? I got to say most of the stuff I do have done over the last you know couple decades. Oftentimes there's always been a non for profit component to it. If oh, you yeah. look at companies now, they're all you know what's our community engagement strategy? What's this you know social betterment? What's happening? Everybody's kind of looking for it. I think it's a great time for us. To kind of make sure we're, you know, ask the question always, who are the right partners? Because yeah. if it's just rely on us. We just don't have the resources to do it consistently enough to cut through clutter. We just, it, it's too hard. So why can't we just leverage other people? And I say people because oftentimes in the past, Tony, it was probably about organizations or in the sport world teams. 
Now it's individuals carry more weight than the teams. A LeBron James has a greater following than the Los Angeles Lakers. LeBron James is outdrawing the Los Angeles Lakers within his social digital footprint. So if he pushes something out, we know we're getting engagement. So it's a positive. It's also a challenge. And you're, then you're dependent on the, the whims of that individual. You know, he or she may say something and you're going, oof, really? I, uh, you got to distance yourself and it's hard to hard to do. Just like we're seeing now in college athletics, this name, image, and likeness. Now we're seeing college athletes have a chance to be on a platform because people give them the benefit of the doubt, whether they deserve it or not sometimes. This past semester, I had a, a young man, Max Duggan, who was the quarterback of TCU that helped them on that national championship run to get to the game. Just a quality young man. You know, and I did some posts on some things and he was just a part of it. But when his name was in it, I had a multiple, probably 10, as far as the impressions and views that I had when he was in it, when he was not. It, it's just, it makes a difference. And we don't know what that tipping point's going to be, but we got to find it every time. Yeah. I mean, I'm with, yeah, it's interesting too, what you're saying. I have, I actually think it's a time for nonprofits to be in more of a leadership role. I feel like there's, there, the industry has always looked as like the second tier to the private sector and the private mm -hmm. sector is struggling to, how do I build trust or affinity and what's my brand? And because people are caring about, you know, are you a good steward to the environment? Are you, yes. what are you doing with your funds? What's your DEI approach? You know, I care about equity and I just don't think the CSO corporate social responsibility groups are the ones that should be leading that. I think the nonprofits have the right and the time and the, have spent years working on this, that they should kind of step up and be leading and sort of being able to give that back rather than waiting for someone else to say, oh, here's how we could profit or profit or partner with you nonprofit. Mm -hmm. They can kind of step in. Uh, I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, just the, the bravery that needs to come from saying, no, we're in a leadership position. Like we get this and y'all in the for-profit sector got to start following on us a little bit because mm -hmm. um, we're not here just to be a halo for you. Please do. I mean, they need it. And I say they, and I say corporate, yeah. really from a enterprise level, Fortune 500, and even the small to medium business, which are just huge, you know, $100 million companies still, they need humanity to be associated with. And oftentimes we can best get that, bring it to the table through a nonprofit cause or effort because it has to be a part of their equation. I wanted to, to dive into the fans have more friends. If you tell us a little bit about the study, but I, I do think there is a correlation here with the nonprofit community too. I mean, I get it. Like if I'm an Eagles fan and I move to Hawaii and I meet another Eagles fan, we instantly have something to talk about. Mm -hmm. But I think there's something similar in the nonprofit space. Like I've been a volunteer with the Special Olympics for almost 20 years. And when I meet other people who do that, you know, I have an instant affinity and I could talk to them about that too. And we both care about it and we're both giving time and money and we've both done it for years and I spread the word. Right. So it's, yeah. yeah how, how does the, yeah. What was the core, what really was the core of the study? And then how could that apply to nonprofits? I think the question for, in my head for a nonprofit is it's, it feels very linear a lot of times in communications. Like I want you, Kevin, to get my email. Now I'm going to build my engagement. You, Kevin, rather than how many other people is Kevin talking to as well? And if Kevin's really up there in that example earlier, you're the number five fan, well, maybe you're having a great experience telling everybody about it. And then you're cultivating that. And But that becomes your thing. Like, I don't have to control how many friends you have. That's up to you. But if I'm giving you something that gives you an affiliation to other people, like how can the nonprofits sort of play into that too? Yeah. So the, the basis for the fans have more friends, again, for a television network, you're trying to figure out how are we engaging all the audiences? How are we segmenting them? How are we doing the right things? What's their usage patterns, their viewership? Are they coming back? You know, how many hours? What are the time slots? You know, all those things you start to look to do. And it's still growth. They're trying to find ways that they can have new categories, new areas like betting, you know, fantasy, betting, other stuff, all these new things. That's where they're they're leaning into because it's all about are you either growing or you're declining in the in the for-profit business. Right. And if you're declining, you're cut. What's next? So you know, they studied as far as who is our who's our audience, how do we make it good for them? And one of the things they came out with, they first of all had to define who are these fans and what, what makes them that kind of that return on objective. What what are they doing that we can measure, we can touch and feel uh, as we go forward? And so they looked at the profile of who's watching games and why, how are they engaging in with it? And then we say watching as a spectator, it's got to be a face-to-face activity as well. So you've got your temple cap on. So why am I watching temple basketball? How do I get involved with that? Am I going to the games? Okay. That's one metric. 
check. Have I, did I buy the program? Did I go in ahead of time? Did I look at the, the scouting report? You know, did I listen to the coaches show? Did I buy my temple? You know, other cap that I saw was super nice. Have I gone to the alumni association? Have I, you know, all the things that are just around us and what we, what they found in the sports world as these social experiences, the more we can have those individuals have an excuse to get together. Hmm. And if they did, they found if you were truly a fan, what they called high value fan. So you were invested in the success of the team and being a part of it. If you were that high value fan, you had a tendency to have more friends. Hmm. And so essentially that high value fan and they, they had three questions that I found was pretty interesting. I, I wrote, you know, I always like to look at them. So how many friends do you have from this origin point? So things I've done with Temple Basketball, how many fans or, or friends have I just developed from that? How much do you value these friendships? So it's got to be a value. It's not an acquaintance. You know, we're, we're acquaintances and we'll continue to do stuff. And we'll probably get to that level that, you know, what does a friend do? Someone you can count on and do it. How do you interact with friends? So what do we do? How are we not isolated? How are we going out? And that's how we kind of determine, or at least in the study, how do they determine what are those fans? What qualifies you as a fan? And what point do you get to say you are officially one? So the high value fan on average had 35, almost 36 friends. The non-fan, so again, good person, all things, but they didn't have a team they followed or a league or something. They had 20.1 friends. So it was almost like a 40% difference. And, and you think about it, you kind of, all right, well, I guess that kind of makes some sense. But even if you're trying to keep up with individuals, we're, we're seeding the conversation. You know, Tony, I care about you and your wife and your daughter. And so I may, you know, everyone saw me say, hey, Tony, what's going on? Uh, you know, the weather hits you, you know, you can do that only so many times and it's boring. Okay. But if, if we're talking Temple basketball, or we're talking something else. Did you see that last night? Was that that's the worst call ever? You know, we have an excuse to have an exchange, and then we may pick it up from there, or maybe a text, and we call each other. No, I didn't. I want to talk further about that. That sucked, you know, or whatever it may be. We have an excuse to have an exchange, a dialogue. Then all of a sudden, we have a chance to do that. And again, then we develop a deeper sense of relationship with each other, and especially, I'm just going to say, it, guys, you know, it, it just it, it not quite as vulnerable of opening up as far as what's there between male and female kind of what's our hot buttons men and women as we're in the marketplace sport is one of those that will allow us to have engagement allow us to have banter will allow us to deepen a relationship to the end of the day we're likely going to have more friends if we do that and if we do that the study even goes on that then our sense of um, happiness is better our well-being, because we're better community citizens, we're, we're involved, we're engaged, we're confident. And so in our own communities, we're now doing more than we probably would because we're not sitting back as an active part or a passive participant. We're not active. As simple as that, you know, it, it can be. So it just starts with providing that, that touch point, which is a sport or a loyalty to an affinity towards a group, that fandom. They call it the fandom flywheel. Just what are the things around this fandom and what it means? And then the chances that we have to support Temple Basketball as our excuse. It's my excuse to take my daughter to a game. You know, she goes, Dad, I don't want to go to the game. I know, but you know how much I love, you know, my team X, Y, Z. You're going to go. Think, and she wants to do it because she wants to be a part of your life. And it's just, a, it's an opportunity to have an exchange. And so from a sport world, that's what we do. How do we emulate that in the nonprofit sector? How do we create these experiences? And besides, again, just an event or a nice walk and eh, sit around. We have corporate partners at the end and everyone goes home and doesn't think twice about it. We talk a lot about that, you know, how, and, and you know, fundraisers care a lot about that too. How do I get somebody from passive to active? Mm -hmm. And I'm just thinking about what could groups do as you're talking and I'm like, if I was able to segment, if I was tracking the engagement, if I really had these measures, mm -hmm. I probably could create small groups and cohorts of people who might know or not know each other and say, hey, we're going to, I know y'all are interested in global health issues and especially malaria in Nigeria. And you've all in different ways have told us this. We're about to have a small group conversation with 15 people and one of our experts. And I want y'all to join and y'all are going to get a chance to introduce yourselves to each other. Because what I would think in my head at the end of that is I brought y'all together because you were fans, but like fans of my nonprofit or the work I'm doing or that cause. But now y'all are going to go off and maybe you'll talk to each other. Mm -hmm. And then this has always been a theory of mine with Parsons TKO and a lot of the community building work I did during the pandemic when we couldn't go out and do things. I started facilitating these events, but I was like, I just like to be, I like to introduce people. 
because then I could just be a glue in their conversation eventually and they'll remember me rather than like I have to be in front of them all the time. But if I can get more people to get to know each other and then they have something in common, like that's great. I feel like nonprofits could probably benefit from facilitating some of that as well. And maybe, you know, it's it seems very easy when it's like a Ronald McDonald house. It feels a little harder when you're Brookings and you're putting policy papers out. Uh, but it seems like the fundamentals, if you're tracking it, could still be very similar and and getting into the ROO, as you put it. And actually, I, I love, I'm, I'm going to tag you into a post after this on LinkedIn because I've got <laughs> I to get that out to everyone. So I had a, and one last question before our final, final question. And you've touched on this a little bit, and I wanted to throw it out because I, I, you know, I know there's there's probably people in our audience that have been listening, and they're like, "Yeah, that's great, but it's the Dallas Mavericks, and I'm like a five person nonprofit. So, yeah, you know, how how do I how do I really take any? And I, I hope we've been pulling some of these fundamentals about engagement and activation and and what people could do. But you know, sports franchises, it's, it feels like they have the the luxury of larger budgets, even though you've been breaking that down for us that, they, that that a lot of times they don't, you know, but what are some of the key elements in affinity building process that are fundamental? No flash needed. They're accessible to anyone working in marketing and outreach. You know, you're, you're sitting there and you're this five person nonprofit and you just got that new communications and marketing role. Like, Hey, here's, here's some fundamentals to think about as you're building out your program. What would you recommend? Yeah, I think, Tony, you probably start with, we got to understand our audience. It, it's marketing 101. Mm-hmm. You know, whether we're in the nonprofit or sports world, who are our audience? No, we don't have all the tools or resources to segment it out completely, but we can all p- make pretty good guesses, mm-hmm. you know, based on what we do know. Understanding, just do be willing to do that deep dive. And so you got to start with the intent of, if we were lucky enough to engage 100 people, 1,000 mm-hmm. people, Whatever it is, how would we, you know, which thousand would we want it to be? Who would be our best customer, our best advocate, our best donor, our best fan, our best stakeholder, you know, within our cause here? And you got to know where you're getting to. And I think we get caught up sometimes and feel like we just have to push things. We think that solves problems. Again, it just goes in the wind. And, hey, was that was that that nonprofit I, you know, was listening to? Even with five people, you, you just, you got to put some basic stakes in the ground. We believe this to be our most valuable stakeholder. I think nonprofits get a little, or at least my experience, you know, from my own efforts, those that make a donation, we have a tendency to kind of gravitate towards them and they may not always be the best people to spend our time with. It's who's willing to invest in us as a, as a cause, as an effort. Those individuals can touch 10 people, 20 people, 30 people that may be, you know, generate more revenues that one individual ever thought about. We have a tendency to kind of focus on that individual. Mm-hmm. And I, I just, how do we do that? So understanding that that profile, sport teams in general, they don't have a lot of money. They are, <laughs> I've said in a lot of meetings and I've been on both sides of the table and basically, oh, that's a good idea. How are you going to pay for it? Go generate the money. You just, you got to go, just like me driving into Washington, D.C. to run a three-on-three basketball tournament. One contact, I didn't have a cell phone at the time because we didn't have that. <laughs> and you just, <laughs> you know, you pick it up and you go, all right, how do I solve problems? How do I generate the attention the support, you know, I got to go get in front of the city. That was a challenging time. This was Marion Barry's, Marion Barry's time as as mayor. I mean, just it was an interesting dynamic. There was, as this kid, new to you know twenty something walking in. Hey, look at me! It was fun to kind of figure out. But I, my heart was in the right place. I knew I'd figured out, and we got lucky, and we did. But if you're just starting out, so again, understanding that profile, who you are, what you're looking to measure. We think we're doing our cause. A benefit we're actually doing the people that we're communicating with a, a, a favor again we want them to have more friends we want them to feel belonged i mean we as human beings are struggling right now because we're we're isolated for the most part there's a loneliness they want to be a part of something all mm-hmm. we're doing is giving them the right cause so we sometimes think we have to push it. We think it's a, a monologue when instead it's a discussion. How am I creating a discussion? So let me understand the audience that I want for the right reasons. However, minimal, minimal facts we have, we still got to come up with a conclusion. What's the dialogue we want to have? And then again, I think you said it earlier, Tony, how do you have, you know, what's the output? Let's assume they say yes. Oh, what do we do now? You know, what do we have our metrics and, and our processes in place enough, whether it's five people or 500 people, we can have the best process we possibly can. Because if people are going to invest their time, which is most important, and yes, their resources, we got to be good stewards right. of that time and energy. 
And we yeah. got to prove it straight away. We've got to be prepared and, and show them that we're anticipating to be successful. We're anticipating for them to be come in and be a part of what we're doing. We're going to make their lives better. We're going to, they're going to have more friends. They're going to have more fulfillment. They're going to have more satisfaction. We're going to enable that. That's the true cause. Hmm. Now to get there, we're going to do a lot of tactical things that are transactional, but we're going to transform their lives. And those are the people we're going to, who are the people we think we have a chance to transform their lives? Because if we can get three of them, then we get 30 of them, then we get 300 of them. We just got to build our, our network of folks that believe in what we believe in. And that mightiness of that small group will be far better than just the, the masses. It's a good example in the sport analogy. I'll use a golf analogy, a, a golfer, Jordan Spieth. At the time, he's coming out, playing on the tour. He's the young kid. He got lucky. Of course, he wins, wins the Masters. That, that kind of helps always, but <laughs> which is the largest tournament in the world. But he had this following. But in comparison, there was a guy named Tiger Woods that was about a multiple three, four, five bigger than Tiger Woods. I mean, and then Jordan Spieth. So they had to figure out how do we look at the audience and the engagement rates. And so they created a, a really an engagement rate for online visibility. How many posts were then shared, reshared, or commented on and, and things. And, and they were able to go to Under Armour and say, yes, we've got one-fifth of Tiger Woods, but here's how we're more engaged than Tiger's audience. All he did is push out stuff, and he's just Tiger. We've got an engaged audience. If you get us, we're going to deliver. And they put it together and it worked. And then he went, he grew exponentially bigger at that time, but it just, it took slowing down, solving what a partner would want to say, hey, I'm going to take a chance on somebody that knows their audience that well, that's going to create an engagement and a conversation for me in the marketplace. He's proven that he can, his post, he's engaged. He's not just a token, someone's doing it for him. And that's not anything negative on Tiger. It was just at that time, he was that person and had people doing things that just, there was not a, there was not a personality that was done it, but, but Jordan was. And so it's the same thing. How do we, we find the audience we care about and then how do we engage them in ways? And we talked about it earlier is as much as our communication style and methods we're, le- we're demonstrating how we want to have a relationship with them. And if that's just transactional and just a male chimp and we're doing a lot of it, uh, you're not really invested in my, my well being. I'm not sensing that. Yeah. We did um, had an episode on here too, where it was about personality, you know, and getting personality, your own personality in the workplace, but getting personality to messages. I think just uh, where I'm going to sum up some of what we talked about. I mean, I, yeah, it has to, you have to have that personality. People want to engage. They want a human. They don't just want messages at them. I really liked how you phrased it, you know, be good stewards of our time and energy. And that goes back to the other thing you just, that I, I'm stuck on now from this conversation, which is communication as the experience. Mm-hmm. Give, be a good steward of, if you are going to send me these emails, what can it equal over time and how can you help me grow with that over time? But yeah, I really appreciate this conversation. It was fantastic. It's everything I hoped it would be. I hope our audience enjoys it as well. Uh, and for anyone who's been a regular listener of our show, you know we have built a Spotify channel based off of the answers to the final question that I like to ask all of our guests. And Kevin, I have that for you today as well. So what is your go-to song when you need a boost and why? You know, when you first asked that, I, I said, you know, my mind goes back to the old school here, Earth, Wind, and Fire. Let me just play, start playing some stuff and some songs from then. But it's interesting. I use music in a different way now. I'm, I was going to say it, I'm very ADHD. You know, when I start going, all of a sudden, look at my computer, and I've got like 37 tabs open, you know, and then the, the spinning wheel of death is just going. And that's the way my mind is going. So when I kind of just stop and turn on Spotify, I'll slow it down. You know, I'll take something, uh, Leon Bridges is a local artist, you know, I'll just uh, put on something that Jack Johnson or just something that just kind of takes me, let me escape. Music and entertainment is that same way. It's either you're engaged or it's just an escape. Mm. And I've been using it more frequently. I just, my mind starts going, but then it starts overload, overload. Uh, let me just stop and, and take a, take a breather there. And uh, so that's kind of the the artist that funny, I was just looking, I just pulled up Spotify to see who I listened to you know, last <laughs> night. And those were the two were on there that I just, I stopped and, and took a break and just put them on. Big fan of Leon Bridges too. And got some of Leon on vinyl here at the house. That's uh, it's pretty cool. Uh, well, thank you for your time. This has been wonderful. I really appreciate it. Uh, yeah. And I'll talk to you next time. And to Very our good, audience. Tony. I appreciate you. That was wonderful. Yeah. Thank you. 
Absolutely. And to our audience, thanks for listening and uh, leave us a review. Give us some thoughts or comments. We'd love to hear from you and uh, share with a friend. Thank you all.